Recently, somebody said something to me that um, agitated me a little bit. And um, I'm repeating it this morning. The person said to me that every six months I come up with something new. <laughs> it agitated me because, first of all, you have to think when you hear that, is this true? That was the first reaction, and then the second reaction was, is this something good or is this something bad? I don't think it was said in a positive way, but um, it made me think. And um, I found something in the Bible that gave me a little consolation, because I found where Jesus said, Every scribe which is instructed for the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. So it comforted me a little bit. If, if I or any of us keeps on coming up with something new. You know, because I thought about it a lot. And um, when, when you keep on finding something new all the time, it can mean one of two things. It can mean that either you're an unstable person. You're not, you're not maintaining what is true. You're jumping around from Dan to Beersheba. But it's also true that Jesus, uh, the word of God says that the path of the just is like what? Shining. It's a shining light that dawneth more and more towards the perfect day. You, 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 if you remain at the same position all the time, you stagnate. You begin to go backwards. So anyway, I thought about it and I took a little comfort when I thought of these things. Actually this morning, um, it, I, I want to preface what I say by this because I'm going to actually go back over something that I've been living on for the past couple of weeks. Maybe in six months, I don't know what will happen. But for the past couple of weeks, this is where the Lord has directed my mind. And I feel like we have been, I've been talking about it at the prayer meeting for the past couple of weeks. And I feel like I want to go back over it this morning and re-emphasize some of the points. Maybe have one or two new insights because many of us have not been at the prayer meeting and those of us who have been there I believe that this, this particular point needs to be re-emphasized a lot of what I share from time to time whenever I stand up here a lot of what I share is based on my own experience if it doesn't help me I don't feel that I have anything to say because if it doesn't help me it's not going to help you that's the way I think I don't know if that's logical reasoning but you want to believe that if something helps one Christian it will help another Christian. So, this morning, I want to talk about the way of the cross. The way of the cross. And um, actually, the song, the song that we sang just now, I especially wanted to sing that one because a lot of what I want to share this morning is wrapped up in those words. Many years I longed for rest. Perfect peace within my breast. I heard Tracy during the Sabbath school challenging Howard with that question. She's not in here now. But um, I often sought the Lord alone with tears, but I would not pay the price. Would not make the sacrifice. So I wandered on and on for many years. And then the words say, let me lose my life and find it, Lord, in thee. Somehow we suspect that in these words, there is a key. We suspect that somehow... In this song, there is something that we, we, we ought to be able to get our teeth into. But somehow, it doesn't seem like we are able to do it. And this morning, I want to talk to us maybe in a more practical way and see if we can begin to experience a little bit more of what we, 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 we should experience. One thing I know is that as we have studied over the past couple of years what it means to have the righteousness of Christ, even how I was talking about it this morning, we believe that in this message we have put our hands on, an, on, a, on, a, on an, a major key. But if all of us are perfectly honest, it has not been 100%. Sometimes I say to God, what else are you going to show me? I've seen truth so beautiful. This very morning I was thinking back on the things that we understand about the broken curse. And I thought, what can be better than this? But still, sometimes, the best of us have to admit, the kind of zeal and fire and stability and victory that ought to be produced 
We don't see it. I feel that with the things that we understand, the world should be a blaze. It doesn't even touch Albion, right? So, that is always a matter of concern. Why, why, why? One thing we know is that it cannot be that God has not provided what we need. Do you agree with this? So, so let, let's take that as a given. What we have asked God for, He has given. Have we believed in Christ? Have we received the righteousness of Christ? Have we been given the gift of His Holy Spirit? It would be appalling if any Christian here this morning would say no to any of these things. It would be appalling. You'd need to go back and re-examine whether you really are a Christian. So the answer is yes. And yet in spite of this, we are motivated to do right. We have been given the power to do right. We have been given the understanding of how to do right. Yet, something is missing. And that is what I want us to talk about this morning. There is one thing that God has never done for anybody and will never do. And that one single thing is, 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 a, is the simplest thing and it's so simple that we neglect it a great deal. And that simple thing is that God will never choose for anybody. He can give you the desire. How many people in here this morning desire to do the will of God? Put up your hand. Right, it's a simple question and I expect every hand to go up and I think every hand went up unless you didn't hear the question. Everybody desires to do the will of God. Do you think a child of, of, of the devil desires to do the will of God? No. no. So you're not children of the devil. You desire to do the will of God. Okay? Do you love what is good? Do you, des do you love what is good? Yes. That desire can only come from God. So don't ask God to give you anything in, in terms of that. He has done it already. Does everybody here believe that you have been given the ability to do that will? Yes. Alright, so we are all in agreement. So there's one thing that we must understand. That the only possible missing ingredient is something that God cannot do. It's the power to believe and choose. And most of us say we believe, so it must be that we have not chosen. Yes, Ray, I'll allow a quick one. I have a lot to say. I will be quick. Would you, would you reserve the capacity that, that God has more knowledge to reveal for us? I would, I would agree. I, I acknowledge that easily. There's a lot more knowledge I believe that we need to obtain. But the point is, I believe that a child of five years old can live a victorious life. I believe that that somebody with the simple basic John 3.16 can live a victorious life. I don't think that victory depends upon the abundance of knowledge. And I think that's one mistake that we have made. One mistake is thinking that theory equates to behavior. And that is not true. Nobody needs more than, than follow Jesus. Nobody needs more than that to live a life of victory. It's understanding how to apply the one sentence. In fact, all the abundance of knowledge that we have obtained have, has probably not made us better in correspondence to the volume of information. Most of us will testify that the, the first day we became a Christian, we were stronger than today. Many of us. I don't know if most, but many of us. And that leads us to understand that information is important in the Christian life. Yes, in terms of understanding and witnessing, but in terms of victory over sin. Information is not the problem. And that's one area where we have fallen down that we probably need to talk about a lot some other time. But I found something that Jesus said here that I'd like to share with you. In fact, I'm going to start with what Paul says and then I'm going to go to Jesus. Go to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18 and I'd like, it, I'd like us to read together. In fact, I'm going to scribble a little bit on the board because I want to highlight some of the main points as we go along. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Not looking in the Bible. You should look at your Bible. I know. First Corinthians chapter one. And I'd like you to find verse eighteen. Now listen to what it says. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish what? Foolishness. Foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the what? I want to write down that word.
When I talk about the power of God, when the Bible talks about the power of God, somebody, anybody, just one person, give me an idea of what comes to your mind. Some event that comes to your mind. Any event? Pentecost creation, the parting of the Red Sea, the sun standing still in the sky. There are events in the Bible that you think about when you talk about the power of God. You think about the, the, the ability to do extreme and wonderful things. Paul says, the cross is the power of God. Unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Think about that. What it implies is that all those of us this morning who hunger for the power of God to be manifested in our experience, the missing ingredient is the cross. In the cross is the secret. To the world it is foolishness, but to those who are saved, it constitutes the power of God. When I see something like this in the Bible, I want to follow through because I want to find what it is saying. Look again at what he says in Galatians 6 and verse 14. Galatians 6 and verse 14. He says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Now, I'm going to find fault with the verse. I want you to look at it and see if you can find any fault with it. There's a fault with the verse, I believe. And that's hard to say when I'm talking about the Bible. But look at it. You have to say it's a translation fault. But see if you can pick it up. I, I, it says, by whom the world is crucified unto me. Yes. And? And unto the world. And? It's Paul speaking. All right, but I want to know what you would put instead. You, 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 your mother, your mother is helping you a bit. It's not by whom. It's by which. Look at it. What is the subject? The subject is the cross. Jesus is not the subject. The subject is the cross. Do you see that? God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It should be by which? What do you see about the word by whom? Well, it's not actually written in italics. But if you look at the, the Greek word, it can be translated as which or whom. They choose whom, but the word should actually have been by which. By which... The world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Notice something that the apostle says. He's, what is it when the world is crucified to me? What does that mean? Dead. It is dead and I am dead to the world. The problem we have is that the world is alive to us and we are alive to the world. Isn't that what sin is? And Paul says the secret to destroying the power of the world over me and I over the world is the cross. And so he says I will glory in the cross because this is a secret to the Christian life. That's what he's saying. I was interested when I was looking at this how <laughs> it's such a strong emphasis in the Bible and sometimes we miss the strong emphasis, right? Don't we? Look at what um, Jesus says in Luke 9 and verse 23. Luke 9 and verse 23. It says, do we have it? It says, if any man will come after me, let him what? Deny himself. And what? Take up his cross daily and Follow me. What Jesus is, says here is that if anybody wants to become a Christian, a disciple of Christ, he must deny himself, number one, two, take up his cross, and three, follow Christ. In fact, Luke 14 and verse 27 strengthens the point a little bit. I'd like, I'd like us to read that. Luke 14 and verse 27.
And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, what? Man, I have to write that word on the board. What does this word mean? It's an impossibility, Brother Lloyd. Except a man takes his cross. And notice, whose cross is it? Jesus. Not the cross of Jesus. Not the cross of Jesus. That's a mistake. I, I was looking through the, the songbook this morning to find songs about the cross. I was trying to find a song that we could sing together. I could not find a song that talks about your cross. Every song I found was talking about the cross of Jesus. It's natural, but I was just thinking it means that people who have been writing songs have not understood the application of the cross to me. Sometimes you hear it, take up the cross, follow Jesus. Um, I was sorry, the choir wasn't ready, we could have sung that one this morning. But I'm thinking the emphasis on the place of the cross, on my cross, is not properly understood or else it will be more emphasized. People have understood the cross of Jesus and what he did and how he bore it. But we have not understood the application to ourselves. But it's a very strong biblical emphasis. Jesus himself says, Anybody who does not bear the cross and follow him cannot. It's an impossibility. If you have not taken the cross, you cannot be a disciple of Christ. You and me. And that is a point, brothers and sisters. I believe that in looking at this, it gives us a clue to the missing ingredient in that formula. God has given us the desire, the motivation, the mind. God has given us the power. But there's a gap between this and our behavior. What is the missing ingredient? I believe that in the cross, there is a very strong clue. And that's why I want to emphasize it so much this morning. Now there are these three aspects to what I call the way of the cross. There is to deny yourself, there is to take up the cross, and there is to follow Christ. What does it mean to deny oneself? Look at Luke 14 and verse 33. Again Jesus speaking, So likewise... Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not, what? All, All that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So the forsaking of everything that you have is equating to denying yourself and take up the cross. Do you see that? The same word is used. Cannot, right? To deny yourself and take up the cross is the same thing as forsaking all that you have. Yes, Tracy. Yes, I, I was... I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to. I wouldn't leave you there. Um, to deny yourself. Let me start with that. What does it mean to deny yourself? To deny yourself means to reject your desires, your inclinations, your preferences, to reject what the heart is longing for. There are people in here this morning who didn't deny yourself and so you have on the clothes that you want, not the clothes that Christ wants. There are people in here who didn't deny yourself so you have the hairstyle that you want, not the one that Christ wants. There are people in here this morning who did not deny yourself so you have a breakfast in your belly that was not what Christ wanted but what you want. Let me say we. Let me make you know that I'm in the, in, in, in the pot with, with, with all of us, right? What I'm trying to say is that denying yourself means rejecting my will. It's rejecting my will. It's saying no to me. That is the hardest thing for me to do. It's saying no. It's the, that's what it means to take the cross. It means to deny yourself first of all. I have a life man. I have preferences. I have things that I like and things that I want. But Howard said it this morning. I'm going to read it. John Wesley said it. He says... The, part, the, the will of man once ran side by side with the will of God and it was like an arrow leading straight to the heart of God. Man's will and God's will was the same thing. But since the fall, man's will naturally runs in the opposite direction to God's will. If you don't decide to deny yourself, you cannot walk with God. Because your will runs contrary to the will of God by nature. So the first principle 
is that God has given you the desire to do good. You will never do good until you first of all learn to deny yourself. I have learned. Every conflict between my wife and I is encouraged because I will not deny myself. Every procrastination when I need to do something and it doesn't get done is found because I won't deny myself. You know how I'm sitting around the computer when I should be doing something else? But self must be satisfied. I must please myself. I want to see the latest, this is the latest, that I want to read this, I want to watch this on YouTube. And something is saying, God wants you to do this. I do not deny myself. I please self. My will is contrary to the will of God. I have not learned to die. Because death means I don't have a preference anymore. My only reason to exist is Christ. Man, what a beautiful picture. What a thing if we could embrace this. We know the mind of God and we know the will of God. The problem is to deny self. God has done everything that he can possibly do through the gospel. Why do you think you have the motivation to do right? The spirit of God is inside of you, stirring you up. The other part of it is already there. The power of God is already there. What is missing is the choice to deny self. That's the first part of the way of the cross. The second aspect of the way of the cross is to take up the cross. First of all, you deny self and then you take up the cross. And what does taking up the cross mean? It means to deliberately, voluntarily take up the things that you don't like to do. First of all, you reject what you want to do, then you take up what you don't want to do. Man, I had, I've had so many... I realized that there are some things in my nature that are not like Christ, me. And it was the way of the cross that taught me. Some things about my, me are not good. Right, maybe I shouldn't expose up myself like I always do. Maybe I shouldn't mention certain things. But I realize that there are certain concepts that people have about me, and some of them are true. Because in some ways, my behavior is not Christian. In some ways. And maybe you don't see it, maybe I'm the one who is seeing it, right? But I realize that there are, there are times and there are ways... When I prefer to be comfortable than to make myself uncomfortable for somebody else. There are people who jump to help people more quickly than I jump to help people. Right? I will help, but I'm not as eager and willing as some people. And the Lord showed this to me and showed me that this is, this is what it means to take up the cross. It, it, it's love and we understand the word and the principle. But love is not a word, it's an action. Love is doing it and what makes you do it? It's taking up the cross. When you want to stay home and you say, let somebody else do it. The cross says, you go. That's what it means to take up the cross, to embrace the thing that you don't like. Man, if you could embrace this, brothers and sisters, nothing would be impossible. You know what keeps us bound in the commonplace and the ordinary? Self and the failure to take up the cross. That is it. We are ordinary and we are commonplace because all we live for mostly is to please ourselves. The extraordinary and the unusual is for books and for dreams and for theories. It is for life and the way to it is to take up the cross. Amen. That's the way, that's the door. You know, it means to deliberately accept that somebody else is going to live his life in place of mine. I'm coming to you, Tracy. It is accepting and choosing and living his way, his activities, his preferences, his humility, his personality instead of my own. Somebody says something to diss me, disrespect me. Self raises up, doesn't it? But we have the cross. What do I matter? All that matters is Christ. Look here, when you take this brother's and sisters, you can do anything. Amen. The problem why life is so hard is... It's easy living when you're dead. It's when you're alive that it's a problem to live. When I don't have an existence anymore but Jesus lives, when I've taken the way of the cross, how easy it is to do anything that God says. How easy? Simple. Man, if God tells you to fly over the mountain, like, like Brother Bill gave me the proverb, if God bids you ride, don't ask for the horse. No. 
The only thing you have to do when God tells you to fly over the mountain is say, take the first step. It's not your business how. God say evangelize Jamaica. What are you going to sit down and think, oh, oh, you cannot do it? You cannot do it because you are still alive. When he says go, the only question is which direction? And then you don't care about anything else. You are his instrument, you are in his hand. Everything is possible. Tracy. Yes. If you don't know God's voice, if you don't know God's voice, if you don't know God's voice, you are in trouble. Please don't do anything. Because I know cases where you are not sure what God wants. Okay? Yes, yes. You want to please Him and you're not sure. You're searching, you're reading, you're praying, and you're not sure. So the next best thing is, okay, I'm a sister Gloria. She's a strong Christian, I believe she. And what that she's doing that, I don't want to do it, so I'm going to deny myself and do what Gloria does. Yeah, when we encounter that one time in ten, then it, it's, it's right to sit still. But there are nine times out of ten, we do know His will. That's the time we must move. Those are the ones that are a concern to me and to God. The ones that we know, not the ones where we are truly in question, because sometimes that might happen. George Muller, the great man of faith, said something that I believe is true. He said, when I was able to let go of his own desires, it was easy to know God's will. He said the problem with knowing God's will was that he had a preference that was fighting against what he knew God wanted to do. So he couldn't, he thought he was confused when he was able to get rid of his own mind. It was easy to know God's will. So I, I think that's, a, that's, that's safe counsel that I've, uh, whenever I've applied it, it has always worked. I can't depend on enthusiasm and my mood and impulse to do something. I get up today and I say, next week, man, I'm going to evangelize Mandeville. I'm going to go through and I'm going to hand out trucks to everybody. You see, next week comes, the sun is hot. It looks rainy. It's hard for me to want to go out there go fish. I can't depend on this. I can't depend on enthusiasm and mood. I wake up in the mornings, my mood is different from the day before. The night before, I was full of happiness and zeal. The next morning I feel apathetic. If I depend on this as a basis for my behavior, I will find myself going up and down. Does that sound like you? Up and down. But if I operate on the principle of the cross, it is death to self regardless of feeling. Feeling doesn't matter. Feeling has to do with self, the desires of self, the impulses of self. This is what feeling is about. But the cross is the application of the principle of the death of Christ. Out of admiration for God and love for God and commitment to God. To take up the cross regardless of what self wants. I want to share something with you. How critical is the cross? The cross is critical. If it's not my experience, Christ cannot live. You, you know, in this, in this age, have you ever heard the word... What word do they use to describe an opening between two worlds in science fiction? Porter. They call it a porter. Okay. I'm aware of that terminology. The way it has come to my mind is that there's an opening between my life and Christ. There's an opening between two existences. There's a portal. Portal really means door, so I, I'm not using any spiritualistic terminology. There is a door between my life and the life of Christ. What is that door? That door is the cross. That door, that opening between two worlds, my world and the world of Christ is, is, is a cross. If I take the way of the cross, Christ will enter this planet. Look here, people believe Jesus is coming back. Some people believe he's coming back with nail prints in his hands and they are looking for him and they are going to be deceived. Isn't that right? Some people carry a cross around their necks. Some people show movies about Jesus and they get all emotional. But for the real Christ to enter this world, he must come through the door that is called the cross in my life. He wants to live again on this planet. And the portal, the opening by which he can enter, is the way of the cross. If we want Christ to live, brothers and sisters, we must take the way of the cross and he will live again. Look! How hard is it for Jesus to do anything that he wants to do if he has my hands, my voice, my feet? 
How hard is it for him to do anything? The problem is the struggle because he cannot get control. Because the way of self-denial and the way of the cross have not been understood nor embraced. And so we live our lives, but we talk Christ. We want Christianity, but we don't give up ourselves. That is the problem. We have beautiful theories, but they never come to life. Because the theory must become reality through the cross. Through the cross. That's the way to make the dream become a reality. To make the theory become a practicality. It is the way of the cross. That is the one thing God cannot do for us. And Jesus says you must take up the cross. How often? Every day. When you get up in the morning, take the cross. When you're having breakfast, take the cross. When you're talking to your wife or your husband, bear the cross. It is I no longer live, but Christ lives practically. All the difficulties we have among us. Can you think if everybody, Brother Maurice, was to take the way of the cross? Can you think of how our fellowship and our homes would run in beautiful harmony? Can you think? Everybody's thinking about not himself, but somebody else. Everybody's thinking about how to make somebody else happy, how to ease somebody's burden, because it is Christ living, not you. You don't have a life, you don't have any mind, no way. It's Jesus living. This is true Christianity. And Jesus says it is the only way you can be his disciple. I want to tell you, I want to emphasize my point. The work of God is not the way of God. Aha. Preaching is not the way of God. Giving out tracts is not the way of God. Witnessing is not the way of God. You know how much of this is done in the name of Christ and it is not the way of God at all? You know how much self is sometimes involved in preaching? And in missionary work and even helping the poor? How much self is involved? That is not the way of God. The worship of God, even the worship of God as it is carried out often is not the way of God. The way of God is the way of of the cross it is a way of the end of me and the beginning of Christ that is the way of God the way of the cross is not about obedience or disobedience it is about who lives that's the press the question who lives it's not about obedience it is about Christ or me in the way of the cross I deny myself not my works do you get the difference in the way of the cross, it's not my works that I deny, it's myself. A lot of people believe that Christianity means to stop committing sin. And that when you have stopped committing sin, your duty ends. And so their, 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 their relationship with God is limited to ten commandments. Their, the, the relationship where Christ lives is far more than ten commandments. Far more. And I'll show you some illustrations in just a moment. I die and, another, and I enter another person's existence. I do not merely choose to take up good works. I choose the good one. The focus is not on doing things. The focus is on Christ living. The focus is on responding to Christ and denying self. It is Christ instead of the will of Christ. Now... It might sound like a little strange, but if you understand what I'm trying to say, you understand where I'm coming from. It's not, it's not the will of Christ, it's Christ. It's not something, it's a person. People focus on behavior. What I'm saying is that, is, is that although it is manifested in behavior, it's not about behavior. It's about a person living. The behavior is secondary. The behavior will follow when the person lives, right? What we are doing is giving a Jesus an opening to enter the world. And we give him that opening by denying, rejecting me. Not my works, but me. When Jesus comes in, I might find myself doing the same works. Isn't that right? But it's a different person doing the thing. And, and it makes a world of a difference to how it appears. And to the good that it does. It's somebody else living. I'm actually saying when I take the way of the cross, Lord, I don't want to live. Right and wrong is not the issue. I want you to live. Please come in and live your life. And he has full authority and permission. Another person takes over my existence. My focus is not on behavior. My focus is on the person. And the behavior follows naturally. You know, I want to read something 
some thoughts from John Wesley. Howard was um, mentioning them a little earlier on. And I'm going to read quickly here one or two things that he said. Now, this is taken from something that was written a couple hundred years ago, a few hundred years. But here's what Wesley said, and I, I appreciate Wesley saying this. You know why? Outside of the Bible, one of the greatest missionaries, one of the persons I read outside of the Bible more than anybody else is, is John Wesley. If you ever read, if you ever read the journal of John Wesley, you'd understand what I mean. Next to the Apostle Paul, I don't find any Christians who, who, Christian who suffered and was as dedicated as this man. Sometimes when I re was reading his journal, I think this man must have made out of stone. He was a little man about my size, maybe about a, an inch shorter than me. So he's a, he was a little man. You could not stop him. He was an unstoppable force. Even in those days, they say he traveled over half of England on horseback. He, it's like he was made out of stone, man. He said one, he, he, one, one, one day he, he, he was traveling on night, caught him, he just laid down on the ground. He said when he got up, he was frozen to the ground, covered with ice. It meant nothing to him. Shake off himself, continue. I mean, I don't even, I won't even start because some of the stories are so amazing. They don't seem like they are true. But outside of the Apostle Paul, I've never found anybody who was more committed to the cause and who did more good for the cause than John Wesley. And, um, and he says, denying ourselves and taking up our cross isn't a little side issue. It is absolutely necessary to becoming a and continuing to be a disciple of Jesus. Maybe we took it up at the beginning and put it down again. So the continuing part is not working. All the things that hold us back from being right with God or growing in the Lord can be boiled down to this. Either we won't deny ourselves or we won't take up the cross. Now he says that there are five kinds of people and I want to read the five kinds of people because all of us probably are in there somewhere. Now the first kind of people, first kind of person. The first kind of man hears the word which is able to save his soul and he likes what he hears. He acknowledges the truth and his heart is touched. Yet he remains dead in sin, senseless and unawakened. Why is this? Not just man to women and girls and boys. They hear the word of God and they like it, but they remain dead and untouched. And why is this? Because he won't part with the sin he loves. Though he knows it is utterly hated by the Lord, he came to here full of lust and unholy desire and he leaves the same way because he will not deny himself. So here's a man who hears the word, he says, so good. I like it. And he leaves liking it and having heard it and he doesn't change because hearing is not good enough. A man must choose to deny himself and to take up the cross. God changes our heart and our mind and our attitude. Now we must follow through and take up the cross. This man doesn't wake up even though the trumpet is blown. The second kind of person begins to wake up and his eyes even open a little. He's convinced by the Spirit of God and he receives the truth. But soon his conviction wears off and his eyes are closed again. Why? Because he continues to give in to the sin that he loves. It is impossible that any lasting work can be done in his life because he will not deny himself. Now number three, this man has really woken up. Aha, that comes to some of us. This man has really woken up. The things that God has shown him don't fade away. The impressions are deep and lasting. That sound like any of us? Man, that definitely sounds like me. Deep impressions, lasting impressions. These things don't fade away from my mind. And yet... He does not feel at peace with God. Man. He could have been looking over some of us shoulders. Although he really desires it. Now why is this? 
It is because he doesn't bring forth fruit in keeping with his repentance. He doesn't cease to do evil and learn to do good. Why? Because he won't take up the cross. His religion has become a beautiful theory in his head. It has become desires for good instead of choosing Christ. That's the problem. And so he remains with these beautiful ideas because the Spirit of God has really touched him. And he has these, beautiful, these wonderful aspirations, but he doesn't go any further. What is to stop any of us stepping out of this congregation today and living the very life of Christ? Only choice. Only choice. Right? Okay, sometimes carelessly something might catch you off balance. Let's give, let's give room for that. When you're just beginning to walk a certain way, sometimes un, unaware, something might catch you. Let's make allowance for that. But generally speaking, a conscious person thinking about what he's doing, what is to stop any of us from stepping out of here and for Jesus to walk out of this place in all of us this morning? Simply the power of choice. Simply that self lives. That's all. Hmm. These people don't completely let go of their sin. Or they continue to avoid doing the good that they know they should do. Because it is something they don't want to do. They never come to a point of saving faith. Because they won't deny themselves or take up their cross. Then he goes on to the fourth person. This one has tasted the heavenly gift and the powers of the age to come. The peace of God has ruled his heart and his mind, but now he is weak. <laughs> he again loves the things of the world, and he desires them more than the things that are not seen. The eye of his understanding is closed again so that he cannot see the one who is unseen. His love has grown cold, and the peace of God no longer rules his heart. And no wonder he has again given place, and no wonder, he has again given place to the devil and grieved the Spirit of God. He has turned again to some pleasing sin. He gave way to spiritual laziness. He made shipwreck of his faith because of the lack of self-denial and taking up the cross. And he continues in that vein, but basically, this is a point, brothers and sisters. The Bible says that if any man will come after Christ, he must first of all deny himself, take up the cross. And thirdly, it says he must follow Christ. And I ask you, what does it mean to follow Christ? Well, I believe that following Christ in this context means to abide in Christ. Or to put it another way, to walk in the Spirit. Meaning what? To continue to deny yourself, to continue to take up the cross, that's what it means to follow Christ. It's maintaining that place and that relationship with Christ constantly. Isn't that right? Paul says if we walk in the Spirit, what? We will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And Jesus says, He that abideth in me, and I in him, what happens? The same will bring forth much fruit. Now self-denial is the mode of walking in the Spirit. We don't walk in the Spirit in our minds. It's not when you're outside meditating and looking up at the sky. That is good. That is a kind of preparation, but it's not only when we are meditating or when we are at worship on Sabbath that we are walking in the Spirit. What about when you step through the church door? What about when you're having breakfast or you go to work or you're in Mandeville? Are you walking in the Spirit? The mode of walking in the Spirit is to deny self and take up the cross. That's how you walk in the Spirit, right? We walk in practical experience. I walk in the Spirit when Aaron says something that hurts me. I walk in the Spirit then. I walk in the Spirit when one of you have a problem with me or I have a problem with you. When I, really, when I understand how am I to deal with this, it's then I walk in the Spirit. It's then I know who lives, me or Christ. Because Jesus can do anything. I can do nothing. Look here, if it leave up to David, any one of you that, that treat me bad, hold a distance. We could go our separate ways. That's David. I cannot, I'm not capable of living a righteous life. I need somebody else because the things that righteousness require, I cannot do them. My way, brothers and sisters, is to deny myself 
and take up the cross. That is God's way. You know, the Old Testament expresses this in a way, in a way that I like. I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament. Go to Psalm 27 and read verse. Let's read verse 14. Psalm 27 and verse 14. All right, it says, wait on the Lord. In fact, it reminds us of a verse in Isaiah 40 and verse 31, which says, they that wait upon the Lord, what? Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Now, one person, one person, tell me what you understand by waiting on the Lord. One person. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? Huh? Be ready to serve Him. Listen to his directive. Okay, man, I thought I would get some wrong answers, but I haven't so far. Yeah, hope and expectation, and hope for salvation, for, for anything is God. All right, I actually got four answers when I really wanted one. But thank you for all the answers. I think, I think I agree with at least about three of the answers, right? Now, I want you to turn to one other verse that I believe will clear up what I'm trying to get at. Go to 123, Psalm 123. And I want you to look at verse 2. I'll read, I'll read verse 2 because since I'm closer to the mic, let me read it. Psalm 123 and verse 2. It says, Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. Now, the idea here of servants waiting on their masters or mistresses put a thought in my mind. Because we have the idea of waiting in our common everyday terminology that gives a certain idea. Have you ever heard of a waiter? Jenny, who is a waiter? Somebody who serves. Right, and a little bit more, but that's good enough. Who is a lady in waiting? Do you know who is a lady in waiting? It's a servant. And in particular... When you had somebody who's always waiting for what? What does a lady in waiting do all day? Stand up and wait until you say do something. You do nothing else. That's what a lady in waiting is. Queens and princesses, you know, they always have the ladies in waiting. All day, their business is from morning they get up and they're waiting. All day they wait. What are they waiting for? They're waiting on their missus to snap our fingers or speak a word. They have no other business in life but to wait and hear what the lady says. Same thing with a waiter, right? You go to a restaurant and what is he doing? He's waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting till you come in and you say something. Then he goes and does it, right? He has no other business but to wait. When the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord, I believe... There is a strong indication that this is a pri the, the, the real meaning. Those who renew their strength and those who are blessed are those who stand immobile until God says move. You don't have a will or a mind of your own. Our will and our mind and our ambition and our, our plans are mashing us up. They are mashing up our Christianity. They are keeping us alive in the world, but not alive unto Christianity. Our dreams, I bet you they are not God's dreams. But God has no choice, because we have chosen the way of the law, let me say, instead of the way of Christ. Why? Because everybody here is a commandment keeper. Or most of us. Most of us are commandment keepers. We obey the ten and we think that is good enough. God does not want your behavior, brothers and sisters, our behavior. He wants our lives. He doesn't want to keep us in good moral behavior. He wants to lift us up above the world. He wants the world to marvel at the kind of people we are. We have to go beyond thou shalt not. God has to have full control of our existence. Jesus says, if a man love me, he will keep my word. You know, love is the motivation. I rem remember when I was 
very much in love. I should rephrase that. When I was madly in love. <laughs> Young people are the ones who are madly in love. Us older ones, Brother Maurice, we are more sober. We, we are in love, but we are not madly. We are in love with care. But when you're madly in love, you go visit the person you love. And if this person is chopping down a tree, you get an axe and you start chopping the other side. And if they're trying to, to move a big box, you grab the box and say, don't, don't do this, sweetheart, I'll do this. And you move the box for them, right? Any job that they are doing, you do it. And you don't care. It doesn't matter, right? And furthermore, two years later, you can remember I went to such and such a place and I was with so-and-so. What were you doing? I don't remember. Because the job was not important. You know what was important? The person that's all your mind was on. The only person your business with, the only thing your business with is the person. And anything the person is doing just to be near the person, but I believe you go to anything to be near the person. The job doesn't matter. You might be as lazy as a snail at home. But when you go there, you are suddenly very active and alive. Everything the person is doing, you're full of energy to help. The problem is not the task, the problem is the person. And that should tell us something about what happens when Christ lives. The job doesn't matter. All that matters is who am I with? And if he says wash dishes, no problem. And if he says evangelize Jamaica, it doesn't matter. And if he says go in man of the square and stand on your head, it don't matter. It's the person that matters. And Jesus says if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's the point. That's the motivation. We say we have the motivation, but Brother Howard was talking about and Brother Maurice, we're talking about the love of Christ. The love of God in giving His Son. We have the motivation. We have the mind. We have the wherewithal. We have the power. Now all we need is to apply the way of the cross. And see this island that we live on. Sit up and take notice. Because if Jesus were to live again in even 15 of us. I tell you, Jamaica are going to take notice. I'm excited. I'm excited because I realize that. I think I put my finger on the key to becoming what I want to be. I think I got my finger and touched the key. Because I have all the theories. I have all the theories. I have all the ideas, all the knowledge. I just needed a way to understand how to put it into practice. I think God touched me on the shoulder and said, this is what is missing. And I think he's blessing the rest of us this morning too. And I hope we can all see that blessing. You know, it's like they say, when a man draws near to God in prayer, he forgets about prayer. And he remembers God. It's like that when you have Christ. You forget about the task. And you just remember the person. Now there's something else that I want to add here this morning. One last thing I want to add to this experience of the cross. It's not an addition. It's, a, it's an expansion of the idea of the way of the cross. And I think this is, the most, this is one of the more important aspects of what I want to say this morning. Go to Psalm 50 and verse 5. Here's what it says. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Did Jesus make a sacrifice? Where? Huh? Leaving heaven? Anything else? On the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, it was called a sacrifice. So, it emphasizes the point that there's a connection between what? Between the cross and sacrifice. Now God says the people he's going to gather together unto him are who? Those who have made a covenant with him by sacrifice. Now I want to just spend a couple of minutes and just, just highlight what it means to make a sacrifice. I want to make, hi highlight, highlight a few points. Turn to Matthew 19. And I want to read verse 12. It's for there, it says, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. 
And they are the eunuchs which have made themselves eunuch. Why? For the kingdom of heaven's sake. Then he says, He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. How many people must become eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake? Those who can deal with it, right? The apostle Paul was one. Right? Now, does everybody have to become a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake? No. Those who are able to receive it. Now, those who have made this commitment, would you say they made a sacrifice? Yes. Who demanded it of them? They demanded it of themselves, right? They did it voluntarily of their own choice. Do you believe they will receive a blessing? Yes. Absolutely. They receive more of a blessing than those who don't make this choice. It's not something you have to do. But when you make a sacrifice, it builds the relationship between you and God. It is doing something you don't have to do. The first thing I want to notice about sacrifice is that not everyone is able to bear it in the same way. Most sacrifices were voluntary. They were not required. What was the only sacrifice that God required of people? I mean, in, 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 in the context of the Old Testament system. The living... The sin offering is a must. The sin offering or the trespass offering was a must. But the peace offering and the burnt offering and the meat offering was voluntary. God didn't require them of, of you. They were not compulsory. The sin offering represented the death of Christ, but it also represented the death of you, the sinner. So that is a must. That's not a voluntary thing. That has to happen. But the other sacrifices were voluntary. And there's a lesson there for us. Sacrifices are not required, but they are offered for the sake of enhancing the relationship with God. In a true sacrifice, you give up what you really want to keep. I want you to think about that. Who here this morning wants a closer relationship with God? In a true sacrifice, you give up what you want to keep. Why? For the sake of building the relationship with God. It's not a must. It's voluntary. God does not require it. It's not about salvation. It's about stepping up into a higher level in terms of your relationship with God. You give up what you really want to keep. It costs you to give it up. In a true sacrifice, you give up what is good. Did God ever require a sacrifice that wasn't good? Okay, that's why you have to get outside of the way of the law because the way of the law only requires you to give up what is bad. In the way of sacrifice, you have to give up what is good for the sake of something better. For the sake of the relationship with God, you give up what is good. When Jesus, when Jesus, when the rich man came to Jesus, he said, Lord, what do I need to be what? Perfect. No, no. Eternal life. Yes. And Jesus says, keep the commandments. Right? The commandments are the bare necessity. The man said, I have done all these things from my youth. Of something inside of me is still hungering. I'm still lacking something. I feel it, Lord. What do I lack yet? Jesus says, you want to be perfect? I'm giving you a shortcut. You want to be perfect? You want to find a way straight to the heart of God? I'm giving you a shortcut. Sell everything you have. And give to the poor and come and do what? Amen. Dear God, there would have been 13 names on the, on the foundation of the new Jerusalem. There would have been 13 apostles, maybe. Right? Man, what a privilege the Son of God gave this man and he opened up the door like this to him. Does God require everybody with money to give up everything and sell and give to the poor? But he says, him that is able to bear it, let him bear it. But what a, what a thing if you can step out beyond the ordinary and take the way of sacrifice. It's a shortcut to the heart of God. It's a part of the way of the cross. But I'll tell you, man, it takes something to do something like this. The emphasis here is on good versus Christ. Not bad versus Christ. Good versus Christ. Good versus the best. What do you want? 
And I know 90%, 99% of people in this world who are Christians will never go beyond good. But I still want to go past that. I want to go past that. And I can't preach otherwise because it's what I want. And by God's grace, I want to rise higher. I would like the world to see an example of Christianity. I want the world to know that God sent his son. I want the world to know that Christianity is real. God wants Jesus Christ to live in this planet again. How, brothers and sisters, I don't know what to tell you, but I know to tell you that Jesus says the way is the way of the cross. And that sacrifice is a part of that way. You know what Jesus says? There's a practical consequence to when you do something like this. Matthew 6 and verse 21, Jesus says, Where your treasure, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where's your heart? Do you want your heart to be in heaven? Man, but if you have got treasure stored up any place on this earth, and I don't necessarily mean money, that's a part of it. I mean other things, the thing that you really love and the thing that, that turns you on and the thing that you spend your time and your energy in. If this is somewhere on this planet, that's where your heart is. That's what you get up with on your mind in the morning. This rich man get, got up every day and his thought was on his money and Jesus was trying to set the man free and turn his thought to heaven and the man couldn't do it because he would not deny himself and take up the cross. Jesus says, where your treasure is, your heart is going to be. An eternal principle, Christ cannot lie, it is the truth. I'm not here this morning telling you about keep Sabbath. I'm not here telling you about committing adultery. I'm here telling you about something deeper in the Christian life, the place where it hurts. Because all of us know it is wrong to, 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 to steal and to break the Sabbath and the rest of it. That's not what we need to hear. We need to understand, we people who call ourselves reformers, we need to understand why we don't rise higher. We need to understand why our reform is not working. Why our words are beautiful, but it doesn't translate into our lives. That's what we are talking about this morning. And I'm telling you, we're not going to grow unless we understand this. We have the cross. That's what I'm understanding from what the Lord has been saying through these verses this morning. Where your treasure is, your heart is. What we can do by the way of sacrifice, brothers and sisters, is fix our hearts constantly upon Christ. Because everything we have is wrapped up in Him. When you give somebody all your money, man, you better follow Him everywhere He goes. I, 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 there's a testimony I want to share with you this morning of a man who became a, a Muslim man who became a Christian. I want to show you this evening. I hope everybody comes. It's a beautiful testimony. But the man says, you know, a man, a man stole his money when he was a Muslim. He put his money in with another Muslim man and the man took his money and ran away with it. But the man used to go to a Christian church. So he started going to the church to find out if he can find out anything about the man. And the brethren said, look here. We will try to contact some people that, and, and get them to talk to this man. So he said he started going to church every Sunday. Not for Christ. For his money. <laughs> so where his treasure was, the only hope he had of the money was to go to the church. So every Sunday he found himself at church because of his money. Where his treasure was, his heart followed. You see, so the principle is there. If I give a girl $10, that's what she will value to me. Right? When she runs away and don't want anything to do with me, I can say, man, it's only $10, nothing. When I dry my account and give to her, anytime she starts showing me a little funny face, I have to follow her up hard because everything is invested in this woman. I can't afford to lose. That's the way life is. Your heart follows where you invest most fully. It's a principle. And God help us to meditate on that. I, don't, I won't tell anybody anything to do. You know something happened to me that some of you don't know and some of you know. But I'm going to trouble it again this morning. Right? I've exposed myself to everybody. Might as well expose it to whoever doesn't know. Right? <coughs> I'm here this morning with my laptop. You know why? Well, I think by the grace of God I can... I could read this. But it's a little much easier to read this. Right? Some, year, some, some months ago, I don't know why, 
Some months ago, I prayed for God to heal my, restore my eyes. I realized that when I use the glasses, they are destroying my eyes systematically. When I put on the glasses and I take them off, I can't see. All I see is many, many. And the place is fuzzy. The more I wear them, the worse my eyes become. So I started praying about my eyes. And one morning, I was praying and I got what I believe to be the strong conviction that God would heal my eyes. I came here before this church and I told everybody that God would heal my eyes and I'm putting away my glasses. So I did. My eyes weren't healed. Days passed and my eyes weren't healed. I'm there squinting and trying to see the computer. And Jen says, you're going to mash up your face getting marks. You're going to spoil your face. Um, <laughs> all right, so I said, okay. Nobody is seeing, so I took up back the glasses and, and started reading the computer. One day, Annalie came there and said, um, you, you think if you believe that God will heal, you should be wearing the glasses. So I said, I can't see the screen. I have to do something. But after she was gone, I was thinking, and I was thinking, am I contrary to my faith? Anyway, struggle, struggle. I come here to church, I come without the glasses. I go home, I put on the glasses. I say, I can't let the virgin see me with the glasses because I'm going to cause people to stumble. So I go home, I put it on, and after a while, the thought came, you're living like a hypocrite. And that cannot be of God. So I packed up all the glasses, and I put them in a bag, and I got rid of them. And I found, to be, I found about 14 glasses in the, in the house. I didn't know. Every time I went away, I go to Walmart, I buy a little $2 pair. Last time I went to Australia, oh, and I, I couldn't see. I, um, I bought three for $1 something each. So I bought all these glasses. So I packed them up and I got rid of them. And now I can't see. Right, especially when I go on the computer where I spend a lot of my time. When the writing is small, it's terrible trying to see. I can read a printed page much better. So I was going on and I remember that I have one more glasses down at the office. <laughs> so I had that, that kind of consolation. And then one day I went down there, so I picked up the glasses and I put it on a couple of times and I thought, man, what are you doing? So I started to pray again. And some thoughts began to bless me. And I'm going to expand on these thoughts another day. But you know the thought that came to me? Tell me something. What kind of God does the Bible reveal? Does God want me to be his friend? Or is I want to be God's friend or is God want to be my friend? Does he want to be my friend? Does God want me to believe in him? Does God want me to trust him like a father? Look here. I realize that God is not a stone wall. Right? We know God through the law. God is like this iron principle. He's not moving. You, pr you ask presumptuously, stay there and soak in your stupidity. <laughs> it's so God is. If I make a mistake, God said, man, you make a mistake, you are stupid. You went before the brethren and tell them that I'm going to heal your eyes. Look, I'm sorry, it's not on the books. Just stay there and whatever it is, you're in there on your own because it's you put yourself there. I thought about it, I, it went through my mind and I thought, you know, a little child comes to his father and says, Father, here am I, what am I to do? You know how I told her something that night? He told her, somebody told him a story, right? One morning, this, 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 one day this guy went to this man at some place, I don't remember, maybe some other place, right? And the man was standing like this, and the guy said, good morning. The man just looked at him like that. And he said, um, you have such and such a part. The man just looked at him like this. Then the man turned around and go back to what he was doing. Not a word for the man that was asking him. Why do you have a person like that? He must be dumb or he's totally without manners, right? You, the next time you come, you're going to talk to that man? Look here. Is that how God is? You come and he's... You go back, Father, son, Father. The next time you come, you're going to go to him? Look, I don't want to know God at a distance. The Bible says in Romans 8, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. 
But you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry what? Abba. Abba. Father. What does that mean? I don't have a father. Somebody not listening to me. Somebody not hearing. Somebody doesn't care when I do stupid things. If I did stupidly, which I don't think I did, right? I'm looking to stand up here before all of you one day and hold out the second thing and read it for you so you can see. I'm looking to show the world what God will do. But I'm learning so much about myself. I'm learning so much about how I live my own way and expect God to jump when I call. I'm learning and I'm changing and I praise Him for not healing my eyes yet because of what I'm learning. But we have a Father. If God is a fiction, let us become evolutionists or whatever. If God is a fiction, but if God is real, Dear God, let us take him out of the realm of the distant being and drag him into our bosom, man. Let us know him. Amen. Let us know the reality if there's a God. That's what it has done for me. I realize I'm, I'm making a little bit of a sacrifice. I gave up something I didn't have to give up. Why? Because it, has, it is binding me into a dependence on God. No, I cannot back out. I can't back out. I go to Kingston and I tell them, I go to Mobile and I tell them, I stay at Albion and I tell them, next time you see all of me sneaking here with a pair of glasses. And I don't say a word and you think, wait, what have I done? I've destroyed all of you, your faith. I've made you understand that something happened, God doesn't answer prayers. I will never do this. I will go to my grave blind. Or, you're going to hear something. If you ever see me come with a pair of glasses, you know that God came to me and said, David, you made a mistake. This is what I want. And I'll have a great testimony to give you. Right? But I, I, I hope that it will be, that he will say, I will do this. And that's what I'm expecting, right? But anyway, I, I told you this because I want to personalize what I'm saying this morning. I want to personalize it and I want you to know that I want you to look at something that, that happens to me personally where I feel like I've made a little bit of a sacrifice that is binding me closer to God and I'm so glad for it. We need to live in such a way that we depend on God. We don't need to live these lives where if you're sick, you have the doctor. If you, if you need money, you have the banker. If you, if, you, if you have a marriage problem, you have the counselor. What do you need God for? If you have religion, you have the pastor. What do you need God for? Tell me. Everything that we have a need of in our life, the world has provided a surrogate, a substitute. You don't really need God. You go through the token motion and you say a prayer. You use a few words and you think that is religion. God is not real. He's not alive in your experience. Is so God want to be at a distance from us? Look here in the Old Testament, God says don't touch the mountain. If anybody touch the mountain, he must shot, be shot through with a dart or he must be stoned. Frighten of this God, afraid of Him. Keep your distance. The Bible says that was then, because in those days men knew God at a distance. But now today, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than the greatest that ever lived. Amen. They could only meet God at a distance. We have Him in our bosom because He has given us His very Son and adopted us into His family. God joined the human race. Amen. And we are a part of the God family. We need to come closer to Him than this distance where He's normally kept. So, I am compelled to fix my eyes on Christ. Every day on Christ. Every day that I'm trying to see the computer, I have to pray. Every day. Every time I take up a book to read, I have to pray. Every time I look in the mirror and see that, I can't see the brown spots in my eyes. I used to be able to see it. Now I can't make out the brown difference from the black. Every time it happens, I lift my eyes to God. I'm glad to have that kind of reminder. I am glad. And we all need... We all need to put ourselves in places where we have to have God in our life. Because if we don't have to, the world will drive Him out of our experience. We'll only have Him in those little bits and pieces when we go to pray. And so the Bible tells us, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with what? With his works and by works was what? Faith 
was made perfect. What work made faith perfect? Sacrifice. The work of sacrifice is what makes faith perfect. You read the Bible and you believe and it's up in your head. Do you want that to become perfect? It's the work of taking up the cross. It's the work of sacrifice that will make that faith perfect. Faith must be fed or it will die. And the only thing that can feed faith is the practice of faith. Learn to reject what you love and what you want. Not just the things you want to do, but even the things that you possess. And God will come more fully into your life. Practically, this is what sacrifice means. It means letting go of material things and clinging to the unseen. And I want to read just one more verse and then I'm going to stop. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 30. And then I will sit down. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord said, Be it far from me, for them that honor me, what? I will honor. Them that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. I want to put it to you this morning that we honor God by taking up the cross, by taking the way of sacrifice. What do we do when we do this? We are saying to the world that God is real, God is alive, and I believe it. Nobody ever takes a risk when he gives up something for Christ. Nobody does. The only person who takes a risk is a person who doesn't believe in God. Isn't that right? You don't take a risk when you give it up for God because you know that God is real. God will honor those who honor Him. The person who takes a risk is a person who doesn't know this or the person who is guessing. There's no risk in trusting God. But it's a risk for us because our faith is not what it should be. But I want to leave you with that thought this morning, brothers and sisters. Yes, Ray. I want to leave you with that thought because I think that's a good note on which to end. I think what we have shared this morning is the word of God. And I hope all of us have been blessed by listening. Not just in our thoughts. I hope we all are able to make some kind of resolution this morning. I have been blessed by seeing this. And for about a couple of weeks now, I have been increasingly learning to take up the cross. But I'm not where I'm going to be yet. And I hope that I will have everybody here exercising this way of the cross. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to ask you all to sing. Somebody was supposed to sing a song? Alright, well, um, I don't know if we can sing, but Dave and Anneli and Jen will you join me and we'll sing the way of the cross and the congregation you can join with us on the last verse. I don't know how it will be because I think my voice is about gone. But you can hear the words, right? And you can empathize with it especially now. The way of the cross leads home. May we never forget. May we always understand what this way of the cross really signifies.
Thank you.